Good morning and welcome to Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church. And a special hello to those of you joining us on Facebook. And all of you might want to go back and see if you can find the typo in the opening um, countdown things. We didn't get anyone posting it yet online, but we're counting on a few people out there who have eagle eyes and must have noticed it. So um, remind us so we correct it. Uh, a big thank you to everyone who came and helped out with Piece of Bread. We had a great crew that worked really well together and had a lot of fun doing it, so thank you for that. Any other announcements to share with one another? No, all quiet. All right, then let us enter into worship together. In the midst of all that tosses us to and fro, in the heart of what makes us most afraid, God gathers us together. Grounding us in our collective power, nurturing our faith, drawing upon wells of wisdom, ancient and new. Our spirits are renewed in the presence of God. We take heart. We trust that fear will not overpower us.
Good morning. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis 37, 1 through 4, and 12 through 28. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers and the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had, born, he had been born to him in his old age. He made an ornate robe for him when his brothers saw that, their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now continuing at 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dotham, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, myrrh, and they went on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the midnight merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels, which is eight ounces of silver, to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Our second reading is from the New Testament, Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Jesus walks on water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. O ye of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. The word of God for the people of God.
Good morning and welcome to Learning Together today. So today I have to solicit a volunteer and I've already hit up my friend Julia. So Julia, would you mind coming on down to help me out today, please? So after hearing the scripture that we're all pretty much very familiar with, I often wondered why all of a sudden, as Peter was walking towards Jesus, and just because the wind came up, he got nervous and started to lose his faith, and he started to sink. So I thought, well, being, you know, putting myself in Peter's shoes, I was trying to imagine how Peter would feel. So now I'm just going to put Julia in Peter's shoes to see how she might feel about that particular stressful situation. Hang on. Yoga ball. I'm sorry for the folks at home who might not be able to see this, but I think it's safest that we go down there on the floor. tricky thing for Julia. Now when I was doing this at home, I did, I did this after my husband went to bed. And uh, I didn't have anybody to help me or catch me. And I don't know if it was because I was afraid of falling. I mean, no, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I could break my shoulder. I could break my elbow. I could break my wrist. And then I was happy to see Julia because I was like, what if somebody small doesn't come today and I need to do this with a bigger person? So it all worked out really great. But the whole point of this is, once Julia was able to trust the fact that I was going to catch her, she was going to be able to focus just a little bit more on balancing and staying focused and keeping you know, her balance all by herself without any help. But you have to imagine that Jesus might have been slightly annoyed with Peter as Peter was walking towards him. And all of a sudden, the wind came and he went, whoa, whoa, and I'm in trouble. And then he started to sink. I can just picture Jesus going, Peter, and grabbing his hand. And then, boom, Peter was all set because Jesus had Peter's hand. So if you will take a quick moment to have a small prayer with me, please. Jesus, you are with us in the good times and in the hard times. We know your hand will catch us when we are falling, just like you caught Peter. May we also help each other and offer a hand to catch someone else when they need it. Amen. So did anyone send in the typo yet? Disappointed. 
disappointed. And it's my typo, that's why I can make fun of it. Um, I, I do the five minute countdown part. Colleen does the rest of the slides, which you'll notice do not have many typos in them, if any. So let us pray together. Gracious God, as we gather once again to offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing love and faithfulness, grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth through the power of your Holy Spirit. As we explore your word, open our eyes to recognize you here among us. Open our ears to hear how you speak to us this day. Give us courage to step out in faith to meet you and confidence to follow where you lead. For you are our God and we are your people called by your name. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now there's this problem with naming sermons because sometimes in the process of reading, reflecting, rereading, praying, rereading, praying some more, and writing, the title no longer reflects what it did a few days before when you thought you'd found the perfect title. And this is one of those weeks. Now, when I first read through these passages, I thought fear, right? That's the common thread. I mean, uh, Joseph's brothers have a lot of fear about their place when Joseph is the favorite. Joseph has fear being in the, fit, in the pit. The disciples have fear on the boat. So I named it Fear Factor. Colleen did come in and ask if we were going to eat bugs during worship. But I said, maybe. And then I read this Sunday's passages a few more times, listening for what it is that God was calling my attention to. And as I read the Matthew passage again, something spoke louder than fear. One word, walked. That's a word that I first noticed in today's gospel reading, right? It says, Jesus walked toward them. I mean, stop and think about this for a moment, right? Here the disciples are on a boat in a stormy sea, fearing for their very lives, and Jesus walks towards them. I mean, shouldn't he run or fly or somehow transport himself from the shore to the boat? But no, he walked. Our culture is addicted to speed. We're afraid of missing out on something. We expect overnight delivery. We drive through fast food chains because we can't even take the time to get out of the car and wait for our order, let alone cook something at home. We replace our cell phones that still work perfectly fine simply because there's a newer, faster model available. Our whole life is done in a rush. In Addicted to Hurry, Kirk Byron Jones notes the words and phrases that pepper our speech. So think about how many of these you hear in the course of your day or perhaps you even say yourself. I'm going as fast as I can. I'm praying for your speedy recovery. Hurry up. Mad dash. Get a move on. ASAP. The sooner, the better. Step on it. Shake a leg. Get cracking. I've got to run. I don't have much time. Wait a minute. Just a second right away. How soon can I expect it? Running late, running scared, run down, running out of time, grab a bite, on the run, it'll only take a minute. You see, we have places to be, people to see, things to do, and no time to waste. Yet Jesus walks to the boat. He doesn't run to the disciples. He takes his time. It got me to thinking about uh, something one of my mentors once told me, that we should 
walk whenever, you know, when someone comes running to us and says, oh my God, this horrible thing has happened, and we go to see what we can do to help, then instead of racing to get there quickly, we should walk to the crisis, not run. Because when you take that moment and you walk calmly, maybe with you enter the chaos. I try to remember that But Jesus walks. We get so caught up in this mystery that Jesus is walking on the water that we pass right by the point that he walks on that water. In the 1960s, Japanese theologian Kasuki Koyoma published a book called Three Mile Per Hour God. He explained that Jesus' ministry was done on foot, that he walked through towns and villages. The average walking pace is three miles per hour. So that's the speed Jesus walked at doing his ministry, three miles per hour. God walks slowly because God is love, says Koyoma. If God is not love, God would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It is an inner speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. Kaioma's theology invites us to stop, to slow down, to see our three mile per hour God all around us. The disciples on the boat were caught up in their fear. When they see Jesus coming to them, they don't even recognize him. They think he's a ghost because only some kind of supernatural being would be walking on water in a storm. And I don't know how I never noticed that in this passage before. It's so common in those post-resurrection stories, right, that the disciples never seem to recognize the risen Christ in their midst. They mistake Jesus for a gardener or for some stranger walking on the road to Emmaus. But I hadn't really paid attention to them not recognizing him in this passage. It's not just their fear in the midst of this storm. The disciples seems to constantly move between knowing and not knowing who Jesus is. They drop their nets on the shore and follow. They witness miracle after miracle, and then they want to send the hungry crowd home, never imagining that Jesus could feed them all with just a couple loaves of bread and some fish. And now, only a few hours after that miracle, the Jesus they'd already seen calm the seas a few verses before that is walking toward them on the stormy waters, and they're sure it must be a ghost because they can't even imagine that it could be Jesus. We have so much in common with those early disciples. We say yes to Jesus, and then we don't recognize him when he's walking towards us. We let our fear take over, assuming the worst. Sure, we have to figure everything out on our own. Jesus walks to the boat, walking across the chaos and the beauty and the brokenness of the world. And he calls out to his disciples to let them know it's him. And he actually uses the same name God uses to identify God's self to Moses, I am. So there is no longer any doubt about Jesus' identity. And then he tells them not to fear. A phrase we hear over and over again in scripture at moments when people are sure to be afraid. When Joshua is called to succeed Moses and lead the people into the promised land. When a young girl is told she will give birth to the Messiah. When a carpenter learns his betrothed is with child. Again and again, God says, do not be afraid, I am with you. Of course, Peter can't wait for Jesus to walk all the way to the boat. Peter's one of those people, like many of us, who's addicted to hurry. 
So he asked Jesus to call him to walk on the water as well. And for a few glorious minutes, much to the surprise of the disciples who remained on the boat, Peter is walking on water just like Jesus until he remembers that he's walking on water in the midst of a storm. Or maybe he remembers he isn't Jesus. And then he starts to sink, calling out to Jesus for help. And Jesus takes him by the hand and brings him to safety. Peter tries something challenging. He fails, and Jesus is still right there, helping him make his way back to safety. Now, if the point of this story were for Peter to learn to walk on water just like Jesus, don't you think Jesus would have said something along the lines of, well, good try, but now, okay, look at me, Peter. Keep your eyes on me. Just take it one step at a time. But walking on water is not the point of this story. The point of the story is to remind us that Jesus is with us when we're scared, when we're taking a risk, when we fail. Jesus helps Peter back onto the boat and stands among those who didn't even risk walking on water. And he never says to them, why did you stay on the boat? Why didn't you try it? He doesn't line them all up and teach them to walk on water. Instead, Jesus says, O ye of little faith, which a lot of people hear is an accusation, but the original Greek gives us a better sense of what it is that Jesus means by this phrase. He's not saying there's an absence of faith. He's saying that Peter has faith and needs to continue growing his faith, which is true for all of us. It's not like you hit this certain point in faith and you're done. There's always more ways to strengthen your faith. The passage leaves me wondering how often we miss seeing Jesus in our midst because we expect him to be different. We expect Jesus to move faster, but Jesus is a three mile per hour God. So what if we lived our lives at Jesus' speed? What if we moved along at the pace of the three mile an hour God, choosing people over technology, relationships over productivity? I had a run in with hurry myself this week. I had a day with back to back to back meetings And I had everything very carefully planned out so I could get from one meeting to another on time. And the day started fine, right? The first meeting began on time and ended in plenty of time to get to the next. I had it all under control. Only that next meeting didn't seem to be aware of the plan. And it didn't start on time. And as I waited and I watched the minutes tick by, I grew more and more concerned about being able to get to the meeting after that. I resented how my time was being wasted. All I could think of was, I don't have time for this. Thankfully, even though the second meeting started later than expected, 25 minutes later than expected, not that I was keeping track, It didn't take very long, and so I was still on schedule. And as I headed off for my next appointment, I got a text postponing that next meeting. I breathed a sigh of relief at the unexpected gift of space and time. Of course, the irony in all this at work and feeling overwhelmed. So we were talking about ways to change that. And I told her about an article that Seth Godin wrote years ago that said our creativity flourishes if we devote 10% of our working hours to doing something other than work. If we go for a walk, we visit an art gallery, we read a book, anything that takes you outside of your usual work gets you away from your desk. It's like when you do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. 
you get stuck. And so you set it down and you walk away and you do other things completely unrelated to the puzzle. And when you come back a few hours later, you read the clues with fresh eyes and suddenly it makes more sense and you can solve the puzzle. It took a little while to realize that I needed to heed my own advice. They do say, you know, that preachers preach what they most need to hear themselves. Funny how that happens, all right? And it's not like I haven't tried before. I mean, I've taken the email app off my phone. I've followed the advice of colleagues to schedule my week so that if I have an evening meeting, I either take the morning or afternoon off instead of letting an eight-hour workday turn into a 12 or 13-hour workday. And every time I commit to these practices, it's as though I'm walking on water. Things go smoother, but somehow before long I notice the storms around me and I'm not so sure that I really can take this time to walk. And step by step, I begin to sink just like Peter. And just like Peter, Jesus takes my hand, gets me back to the safety of my boats and my companions until I'm ready to try slowing down again. So how do we slow down? How do we become unhurried, free from distractions, attentive to the world around us like Jesus? How do we match the pace of our three mile per hour God? It's really quite simple. You can go for a walk, sit on your front steps in the evening, Redefine how you use electronic devices. You know, they're supposed to make our lives easier, not more complicated. Remove a few unnecessary items from your crowded calendar. Set aside a few quiet moments every day to read God's story and find your place in it. Commune with God in prayer. It's really that simple, but as you well know, such steps are really countercultural and they're hard to maintain. Our three mile per hour God invites us to slow down and to live life at a savoring pace, a pace in which we can relish all the beauty in life, a pace at which we can see our three mile per hour God without needing the magnifying glasses. So are you ready to adjust your pace? Will you slow down so that you can see God's presence in our midst? Amen.
You may be seated as we turn our hearts to prayer. God of infinite patience, save us from our relentless schedules. Call us back from our worship of busyness. Teach us to walk. Teach us to walk slowly enough to recognize you in our midst. Open our eyes to the needs of others as we pray for healing and wholeness for those we know. For Stephen, Peg, Cheryl, Jared, Molly, Liam, Claire, Jonathan, the Burchams, and all those we name in our hearts. And we pray for healing and wholeness for those we don't know, for all those places torn apart by conflict, by lack of resources, by natural disasters, most especially Ukraine and Maui, and all the things that leave us trying to make sense of what's happening. We ask for your strength and guidance for all leaders that they might respond with compassion. Gracious God, as we prepare to go back into the world, we pray that we may reflect your love in our families, our church, and our community, so that the world will witness that we are followers of Christ and others will be drawn to his loving care. So let us now pray together as Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning we celebrate first all of these wonderful backpacks that have come in that will be taken to the Department of Children and Families to be shared with uh, young people in our communities who uh, don't have backpacks and uh, supplies and need them to do their best work at school. So thank you for your generous outpouring. In this community, we are buoyed by love. We are made capable of doing hard things, of taking risks and bravely facing the circumstances that surround us. What a gift it is to have people among us who've figured out how to walk and encourage the rest of us to slow down. People who listen for God as they walk, sometimes hearing a name and following up with a phone call only to discover that person needs a helping hand, a word of encouragement. People who take the time to sit by a bedside and listen to stories people who take the time to knit prayer shawls for someone who just needs to be wrapped in God's love, people who model how to follow Jesus with our whole being. With gratitude for these people and this place of belonging that nurtures us all, and for God's presence with us, let us bring what we have together and offer it to God.
let us pray together. Courageous one, nurture in us the seeds of faith you have planted. We believe in the transformative power of love. We believe in each other. We believe in your creative presence in the world around us. But God, we struggle to live our beliefs. As we bring together our resources, we pray for your blessing upon our shared labor. May all that we do reflect the radical and abundant faith to which you have called us. Amen. Beloveds, take heart. Though evil works to limit our sense of possibility and injustice threatens our dreams of collective flourishing, God remains as close as our own breath, making the impossible possible among us. In community, we have what we need to love each other and our neighbors well. So let us go and live what we believe. And all God's people say, Amen.